if you are able, would you please stand for the reading of God's word from the prophet Isaiah chapter 61. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins and they shall raise the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord, and my whole being shall exalt in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with garland and a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before the nations. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. What would a perfect society look like? There's a philosophical thought experiment that people can use to help them figure out what the perfect society would be. John Rawls coined the term veil of ignorance. He said, imagine a group of people gather together to form their ideal society. But there's a catch. No one in this group knows who they would be in this new society. They do not know if they would be wealthy or if they would be living under the poverty line. They do not know what abilities or disabilities they would have. They don't know if they'll have a large family or a small one or be single. They don't know their race or gender, and so people come together, just as people, to dream up their ideal society. What he concluded was that by using this stance, this veil of ignorance, liberty was made available to more people. All people were given a more fair chance to prosper. There was more aid to those on the margins. And ultimately, there was a greater emphasis placed on fairness. Because you didn't know who you'd be in this new society, a win for the most vulnerable was seen as a win for all. When I read our scripture for today, I heard echoes of this fair and just society that looks out for others, especially the most vulnerable. The difference here is that in our scripture, we hear of a very real kingdom of God. Just like in the veil of ignorance, there is a piece of good news in this story, in this passage, for all of us. Good news to the oppressed, healing for the brokenhearted, liberty for the captives, release of the prisoners, comfort for those who mourn, a spirit of praise replacing a faint spirit, Ruins repaired, and we hear of a God who is just and fair. This, my friends, is good news for all of us. But there's a tension here, isn't there? This prophecy being proclaimed. But we wonder when, how, where. You see, this is precisely good news because there are people 
who are oppressed, brokenhearted, captive, faint in spirit, who are looking around at years of devastation. So this leads me to ask, along with them, how does a weary world rejoice? God is promising a transformation. Advent is a season of waiting and preparation for God to transform the world through Jesus Christ. Isaiah's word tells us this transformation is not an empty hope, but a sure promise. And these words of Isaiah, they sound familiar, don't they? Mary, mother of Jesus, sings of this type of transformation in her Magnificat. Found in Luke 1, Mary rejoices after finding out she is to bear the Son of God. She rejoices at all that God has done and is doing. She gives testimony to God's mercy, justice, and love. She rejoices that through her Son, the hungry will be fed, the powerful will be held accountable, and the lowly will be lifted up in fairness, maybe even into a place of favor. Mary proclaims that God's promises are true and unfolding. She says in Luke 1, verses 54 through 55, He has come to give aid to his servant Israel, remembering his mercy just as he promised to our ancestors. Mary joins with Isaiah in proclaiming that God is working to transform the social order of the world. The coming of our Savior is turning things upside down as finally the oppressed are hearing good news at last. As the lowly are being lifted up, Jesus' birth and ministry will turn the status quo as we know it upside down, or dare we say, right side up again. We may not sit behind a veil of ignorance, but when we look at the world through the lens of our faith, we can see so clearly how this is good news for all of us. Because good news for the poor is good news for everyone. Because we cannot be whole while a brother or sister suffers unfairly. Isaiah and Mary profess that Jesus comes to bring good news into reality, along with several other voices of scripture, but Jesus tells us this himself. Flash forward 30 years from Mary's song when she was cradling Jesus in her womb, we hear a story of Jesus reading scripture in the synagogue, and what does he choose? None other than the words of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. When he was done, he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the synagogue assistant and he sat down. But all eyes drifted to Jesus and he began to explain to them, saying, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled, just as you've heard it. This is the passage Jesus chose to read as his inaugural sermon. These words of Isaiah are God's own mission statement. Jesus is here to fulfill the promises of God, and that is good news for everyone. This good news, though, was difficult to understand as Jesus shared it in the synagogue that day. He was met with uncertainty and questioning. Isn't that Joseph's boy? People asked, almost as if saying, you mean this is the guy we've all been waiting for? We're not so sure. But why would they? Why would they suspect it was Jesus all along? For someone to come as the Son of God, proclaiming to transform the social order of things, wouldn't they need to be mighty or powerful or a ruler or a king or someone with some status? That's not this Jesus. 
who they watched grow up in Nazareth, born to unwed parents, they've probably all heard the rumors. Jesus who lived in poverty, this is the one who comes to bring the good news? But where else would he be? Have you ever watched the TV show MASH? Anybody? Yeah? My father-in-law and my husband love watching MASH reruns when we visit. MASH, for those of you who may not have seen it, is a war show about a surgical unit during the Korean War. And I was reminded of one particular episode when reading Dr. Luke Powery's book, Becoming Human. There's an episode where a man is suffering from a psychiatric break, probably brought on by all that he had witnessed in the war. He arrives at the hospital proclaiming to be none other than Jesus Christ. So he goes around the barracks preaching and prophesying and proclaiming to be Jesus. And the characters on the show also aren't buying it. The man goes on and on, preaching and trying to convince people. And so one doctor tries to reckon with him, reasoning, asking him a question. Now, if you really are Jesus the Christ, what in the world are you doing here in a war zone in the middle of Korea? The man looks off, taking time to respond, tears collecting in his eyes, and he says, where else would I be? I'm with my children. Perhaps this is why a weary world can rejoice. Christ who is born to us, not as a ruler or a king or someone we would expect, but one who is called Emmanuel, God with us. God comes to be with us, the brokenhearted, the hungry, the poor, the grieving, those with tired spirits. It is unto us a child is born. This is why a weary world rejoices, because our God promises to transform the world through the birth of Jesus, a Savior who comes to be with his children in all our mess, in all our agony, in all that we are, Jesus comes. As we move into our final week of Advent, I ask that you be watchful. I really seriously pay attention to the ways that God is fulfilling these promises in your life. Perhaps the best news is that God does not leave us in a weary world to figure it all out on our own. Instead, God comes with us. God was at work in the prophecy of Isaiah. God was at work in Mary's womb and in her words. God was at work in Jesus' ministry. And even now we proclaim that God is still bringing good news to all of us this season. I have seen God's good news brought to the children at Methodist Home for Children as we sent gifts to 18 families last week. I have seen God show good news to the hungry through our food pantry, which served over 7,000 guests so far this year. I have seen God show good news to those in need through the men's Christmas tree sale proceeds, sending over $1,000 to local charities, and through the United Women in Faith's bake sale, sending over $5,000 to local schools. In all of these ways, God is announcing good news to those who need it. This is indeed good news for all of us. This is how God is at work transforming the world. Likewise, I have seen God show up with us this year. Last Sunday, I saw God with us at the light of the Christ child service as people hugged one another and shared words of comfort. I've seen God with us as we've grieved this year, as we've told stories and cooked meals for each other. I have seen God with us at the preschool with this week in the care given to even the littlest disciples. I have seen God with us in the ways you show up and walk your faith journey with one another. 
So as we approach this last week of Advent, pay attention to all the ways God is fulfilling these promises in your life, through your life, all because of the birth of Christ. May we look for God in unexpected places because where else would God be? May we celebrate good news for our neighbors as we would good news for ourselves. May we wait and prepare for the world is turning right side up again. May we, a weary world, rejoice. <laughs>